Well, welcome to the graveside of Professor Frederick Charles Shoy. I'm a fellow fraternity brother of his. The gentleman we recognize today was not only a member of Sigma Chi fraternity back in 1891 at Purdue, but he was the one that started our chapter of Beta Delta Sigma Chi here at the University of Montana campus back in 1906. We'll talk a little bit about the history of how that started because it has come some interesting rough western heritage uh, to get our uh, brethren out of the east at the time. The professor, Professor Shoy was born in Lafayette, Indiana back in 1871. It wasn't long after that because his father Herman was with the U.S. Consulate, an ambassador to the United States and to Spain. So young Frederick spent about 10 years over in Spain, traveled between Seville and Barcelona during that time, became very fluent uh, in Spanish, traveled quite a bit of Europe with his father and, uh, and his brother and sister and uh, so was very fluent in not only Spanish but in French and German also. When he returned to the United States prior to uh, attending Purdue University and, and graduating in 1891, uh, young Frederick had to take classes in English because he was so, he had spoken other languages so much that had uh, very little English to, to his name by the time he came back to America. So uh, they had to bring kind of his English back. So I uh, tell you right there, he did a lot of study and, and took a lot of pride uh, where he grew up uh, over in Spain. Uh, as we talked to the end of the story, there was Spanish manuscripts from medieval Spain from Don Carlos that uh, his father Herman had acquired over the years and uh, uh, supposedly 400 manuscripts and have been farmed out. Uh, only about 350 are, are uh, known today. There are some that are missing, but they sit everywhere from the University of Montana and these are, these are important Spanish histories of medieval times uh, that the Shoy family have uh, come in contact with. And, uh, but there's the Smithsonian Institute, uh, seminary out in California, and Georgetown University. Uh, so, born in 1871, he come back to Missoula after graduating from Purdue University. And uh, come to Missoula around 1895. Prof, Prof Shoy, as we called him, uh, and what he liked to be known as, uh, was part of the first faculty of the University of Montana in 1895 along with uh, Dr. Craig who was our first president also a Sigma Chi out of Stanford and uh, he had uh, ties in with uh, the Bonner brothers later on who uh, along with the, the Higgins brothers who were Sigma Chi's uh, a long lineage of Sigma Chi and his influence of Sigma Chi in this in the West uh, later on in the early 1900s. But in 1895 was he got together with uh, gentlemen like uh, uh, Morton Elrod, Eloise Knowles, Craighead, some of the names you recognize in Montana history and, and especially at the University of Montana here. Uh, worked on it with faculty, uh, with the good professor for quite a few years. He um, is instrumental in uh, bringing the first 500 trees into the university, the first, the first 20 acres that were uh, donated for the University of Montana itself in 1895. In 1896, all these trees came in, but uh, you know, back in those days, we didn't have a whole lot of water to, to feed them like we do nowadays with the hoses and the sprinklers and things like that, so they grew pretty slow. So in the interim, uh, you know, by the early 1900s, we had three or four buildings. First one was Main Hall. Uh, it was completed. The, the, the seven-ton cornerstone was laid uh, in 1898, and uh, the tradition at that time was corn oil and water to be poured over the stone itself to uh, to show uh, plenty, plenty good harvest, plenty of food for the state of Montana, for peace uh, during the conflicts that may come ahead of us, and prosperity. And so those were two traditional elements that were poured over that uh, seven-ton cornerstone in Main Hall. At that time, that housed the president. It also were classrooms, uh, a little bit of dormitory, and as well as some labs and things like that. So it was kind of the, it kind of did it all at the time until uh, the science building was, was uh, built and uh, Craig Hall for the dorm. The, the uh, Craig Hall at the time was a uh, dormitory, uh, it was housed about 80 women. And uh, one thing that Prof Shoy uh, had a concern on at the time was the idea that there were no fire, fire suppression, uh, there was no, no way to get water in to the, in the dorm at the time, no fire escape. So in those days, they built a building, put the women in there or the men, depending on what dorm, uh, as they came up over the next several years, uh, but no fire suppression as we know it today. So that was a real concern for Professor Shoy. Uh, 
In uh, about 1903, the oval, which Professor Shoy uh, had a heavy hand in, it was, uh, he didn't want a circle, he wanted an oval with buildings to be facing in with a, uh, what they called uh, later in uh, around 1917 when he was president of the university, uh, a guy by the name of Gilbert had a, an idea of a biaxial type of placement uh, where they brought Renaissance revival, three-story buildings architecture in with hipped roofs and a Spanish architecture with the Spanish red roof. Uh, so we still see that around the University of Montana campus yet today, despite the modern architecture we see going on. So there's a huge Shoy influence there. He uh, taught notables as Jeanette Rankin, who graduated in 1902 from the university. Paul Dornblazer in 1914. And our own Mike Mansfield, a congressman and senator for the great state of Montana in 1933. Uh, during his tenure as president, 1915, 16, and 17, uh, World War I was a primary influence, obviously, at the University of Montana. Uh, September 17, 1915, the student population at the university, roughly 527 students, 206 of them were freshmen. And uh, roughly over the years, that's kind of where they kind of stayed, uh, a little bit less than half were always incoming freshmen. P Professor Shoy was the, uh, the president that uh, really instigated the homecoming as we know it today in this day and age. Uh, in 1914, the first president of the university, uh, fellow Sigma Chi brother, uh, Craig, was determined that November 6th was a good time for, they noticed that students uh, from about 1896 forward that were coming back to the university in the fall time of the year to kind of meet with old friends and things like that. And it was Professor Shoy that determined that uh, it was the end of November when they had uh, the first big game against Syracuse, uh, against the Grizzlies. Now back then, uh, a round trip Northern Pacific Railway ticket was $44.70. And so uh, every once in a while when we get some big, big games out there uh, here in Montana from the West, it was Northern Pacific that bring these teams in. It wasn't like the regular play that we see nowadays, but it was big in 1915. Now during the World War I uh, years, uh, there were no Intercollegiate activities, no competitions, no foot races. Uh, they did a lot of foot races, a lot of track meets, a lot of cross country in those days. They were all suspended during World War I. And, uh, but when World War I uh, come to a completion in 1919, it was our first official homecoming uh, with uh, the Bobcats out of Montana State University, uh, where they had a record 600 alumni come back for that. Uh, on a Wednesday night, they had firesides. And to this day and age, we have fireside. In fact, we still have fireside dances at the high school level, but they called them firesides back then for Wednesday nights. Thursday mornings was the pep parade, where they would uh, have everybody come downstairs or downtown and also to the university for the parade. And then uh, Friday or Saturday would be the big game. And uh, that's where the, the original homecoming, <laughs> at least at the University of Montana, officially started, was initially in 1915, then the war years hit, and 1919 was the, the from then forward, were the healthy homecoming years and our bobcats have always been the, the ones, bless their hearts, that uh, always made, made uh, preparation for homecoming exciting. So in 1915-17, he, uh, some of the issues, many things have not changed from today. Our youth uh, that we are always concerned with, uh, the yays and the nays <clears throat> back then. Uh, some of the caveats on campus, the, the freshman boys would come on and they had to wear green caps without fail to show that they were freshmen, they were marked. The young women had to wear their hair coming flowing down the middle of their backs and were tied with a big green ribbon identifying them as freshmen until the first of December uh, when all bets were off. Now there were several times the freshmen had opportunities to challenge the upperclassmen to a tug of war down by the river in an old slough full of mud, nasty stuff. And uh, it was known, it is said, that the upperclassmen from time to time, depending on how big the new fresh incoming freshmen were, would anchor down deep an old post. So it would assure that the upperclassmen would not lose the tug of war. So, uh, so until then, the green caps and the green ribbons would stay uh, with the freshmen until then. Along the same lines that Professor Shoy had to deal with was the M up on top of Mount Sentinel. At the time, it was wooden during his tenure as president. Well, they would, uh, much like the tripod you see back here, it was a big wooden M that stood up 30 feet in the air, and then they would uh, lean it up and with support in the back. Now, a cement company in the early 1900s offered to bring the powdered cement in and donate it for free. If we get the buckets of water up there to the M, 
and it would make a longer lasting concrete structure. Well, the upperclassmen at the University of Montana at that time said, these pledges coming in, or they call them pledges, sometimes they'd call them neophytes, the incoming freshmen. We weren't going to make it easy for these freshmen. We wanted to make sure that they did the same thing we did when we were incoming freshmen. That wooden M stays up on the hill. They're going to sand it down. They're going to replace the wooden boards and the planks, and they're going to paint it year after year. So the cement idea until later on, another 10, 15 years down the road, we would not see the cement. Uh, during Prop Shoy's time, they did bring the rock in and whitewash it. The uh, University of Montana forestry uh, students were the ones that cut the initial path up, uh, up to the M itself. One thing that Shoy had to deal with was a request of firearms, of guns, pistols, uh, because of the fear of the uh, game that were up there snooping around when the students were up there doing their thing with the M. Uh, the biggest thing they had to worry about were wolves. They did have some big game like our deer and our elk, things like this. But a real concern were the wolves that were, were meandering around smelling the students. They could probably smell them for quite a ways. So Shoy had to give the blessing of getting uh, pistols and, and rifles up on the mountain while they worked on the M up there from time to time. Kind of an interesting, interesting thing. The young uh, freshmen could not uh, leave the campus without an escort of upperclassmen. Uh, girls were not allowed to wear anything but one article of jewelry. Young lady over here is wearing a necklace. If she was a freshman at the time, she would only be allowed to wear that. She could not bring the earrings into it to complement the beautiful neck piece she had on, uh, on her person at that time. If she wore a bracelet, she couldn't wear the earrings or the necklace. They kept it simple, very, very pure. Yes, you have a question? Um, what if you were, like, just got your ears pierced? You know, and back then, I'll bet they didn't do a whole lot of ear piercing. I imagine they were clip-ons. Am I, do you think that could be? You know, the, the, I'm not sure when the piercing came in. Very good question. They were very, very strict. Uh, when they walked into a room, if it was a woman walked into a room, if it was faculty or staff, or an upperclassman, those freshmen would rise, would stand, especially when a woman would walk in. It was a sign of respect, especially for their elders. Uh, your high school students that would come in and be first year freshmen, if they were caught wearing high school rings or a necklace of any kind identifying their high school, they could only wear them at night or when the moon was up high in the air. If they were caught during the daylight hours with any high school jewelry on, it was known many times these freshmen would find themselves in the middle of the oval where an old bathtub was placed for a good old fashioned cold tubbing. If you forgot your green ribbon on your hair, if you forgot your green cap, freshman men, the bathtub would come out in the middle of the oval and you'd be cold tub in front of the public. It's a very humbling experience. My understanding, sometimes it still goes on at the university. Just what I hear, I'm not sure. <laughs> but the discipline was there, the respect was there. Uh, the students could not congregate in groups larger than three because of hooliganism that could go on at that time. So they'd keep those groups to three or less. It was very, very strict. One of the things that really bothered Professor Shoy when he was president in the Oval, now you can picture, during World War I, the priority was war. Uh, you'd see these men who were marching, the freshmen would march back and forth, uh, some in military uniforms, whatever they could get from the U.S. government. And uh, the uh, Bonner brothers, who uh, one was the dean of forestry here, would, would work with Professor Shoy and the U.S. government on working the military. Uh, by the way, the Bonner brothers were, were Sigma Chi's. And uh, they would work their brigades back and forth but they also had potato crops out there in support of the war, and they would, uh, they would support Missoula and our war efforts overseas. So we had potato fields on campus at the time. The Oval, uh, until about 1903, 1904, University Avenue would, uh, would intersect the Oval itself. So uh, you can see that, you know, and, and as you look toward the north, uh, there were no, no houses of any kind. Uh, so it, it looked really odd and no trees. It wasn't until 1896 where basically the first 500 trees were planted on that campus. So they had lots of potatoes, they had lots of brigades marching back and forth. And uh, Professor Shoy with the sod and the grass that was on the oval at the time was so upset because these kids kept cutting across. Instead of using the, the brick pathways, they'd cut across the grass. Now, as an alumni of the university myself, at the undergraduate level at the time, I too cut across. My hoof prints have gone across that campus and more often than not, and my brother, Professor Shoy, would not be happy with me. He probably found that that was a battle that he lost and he lost the war too because this very day those troughs still exist across the oval in every which direction except on the sidewalks. So we probably in some respects haven't come very far. So I imagine at this day and age, 
Professor Shoy would, would be smiling from up above, bless his heart, for, uh, for what hasn't been learned. Uh, our youth, not much changes, uh, changed over the years there. An interesting uh, aspect, uh, in his tenure at the university, uh, he became friends with the Secretary of the Navy uh, through his, you know, the brigade marches and, and getting the uniforms, things like that. And uh, in 1908, the USS Montana was, uh, became part of our Atlantic fleet. A couple of interesting stories on this. And uh, as it did its service between Spain and uh, we had service over in Cuba. At one time, uh, we had brought, uh, transported in several uh, treks across the, the great waters, uh, almost 9,000 men uh, back from, from Spain from the wars over there. And uh, when this was decommissioned in 1921, the USS Montana was then sold for scrap in 1930. There was two sets of galley doors and a thousand pound bell that was donated to Sigma Chi fraternity and the state of Montana from the relationship that Professor Shoy had with the uh, Secretary of Navy. Now, it's kind of odd from what I understand. Other congressmen and senators around the great uh, nation that we have here were concerned how could someone in Montana like Professor Shoy have the contact? How did he get the galley doors? How did he get that thousand pound bell? Well, we never really fully will understand the, the story. But what is known that in 1930, those items came to the Sigma Chi house. One set of galley doors remains at the University of Montana Law School, and I have never seen those. But I will tell you that the better set of the galley doors reside at 1110 Gerald in Missoula at the Sigma Chi fraternity today. As you walk up the front steps on your left, before you go into the big uh, heavy glass door, the pillar on your right side is a, about a four foot tall by two and a half foot wide uh, galley door that has our nation's emblem, the eagle within its talons, the sign of peace and the sign of war. On the left pillar is the other galley door which is the great seal of the state of Montana. It looks like it was carved just yesterday. Those, those pieces are a good eight inches thick. Uh, the detail that uh, craftsmen today probably couldn't, uh, couldn't even bring forth. Those galley doors are intact. Most people don't know they're there, thankfully, uh, because with the vandalism and arneriness in the Greek system and our community over the years, uh, the many things have been done uh, at that facility. Uh, the galley doors have not been uh, impacted by any means. So it's uh, really a, quite a, a piece of our national history and you're always welcome to come up to 1110 Gerald and take a look at those uh, galley doors because they are amazing. Now the bell on the other hand, we as fraternity members had those in our had that thousand pound bell in our possession in 1930. Now after Professor Shoy's death in 1954 is when he closed his eyes for the final time and entered the chapter eternal 1955, Lambda Chi out of the University of the Montana State University out of Bozeman. Now, if any of you are Lambda Chi's, forgive me. But they came over and stole that bell from us right out from underneath our nose. 1955, and it wasn't until 1978, you know, as I got to know Professor Shoy in my research in the archives at the University of Montana, I was a president of the fraternity in 1977-78. Now, everything this man has done over the years it was amazing to me, not only as a fraternity brother, but as a man and a citizen of this great state. But I hope I don't go down in history of the Sigma Chi here at Beta Delta Chapter as the guy that lost the bell, because in spring break of, of 1978, after giving the bell back and we erecting a great tower with a plaque to Professor Frederick C. Shoy, the bell was back in our possession. We dedicated it to the good prof, we hoisted it proudly, had a big dedication, got all kinds of PR here in Missoula. And we hours, we hours one evening, one morning I guess, while we were all on spring break, we had been to our respective houses somewhere else in the state of Montana or out of state. We had a couple brothers that still stayed in like they do nowadays over spring break. But someone come into the fraternity outside the house where the bell was hung and with blow torches or with, with heating torches come in after they backed the pickup and took that thousand pound bell in a matter of minutes and dropped it in the back of this pickup. Now that was 1978. And it wasn't until 1999, there was, at that time in, in, the, in the late 70s and early 80s, there were, there were alumni and undergraduates were so upset about the loss of this such a fraternity prank. We thought of Prof. Shoy, we thought of the USS Montana, Montana military history. It was an insult to all of us. We couldn't do a thing about it because we didn't know who had it. Was it on the floor of the Great Clark Fork River? 
We heard it was up in Alaska. We heard it was out in California somewhere. We didn't know what fraternity, if anybody, had their hand in this, but it was gone totally until 1999 when we started getting word that the bell was coming back to Missoula. But there was a caveat. The bell was not to be returned to the great brotherhood of Sigma Chi fraternity, but instead, for anybody to see it, brothers or the community, it had to be given, donated, on behalf of Sigma Chi to the University of Montana. So as you walk into the field house of Adams Field House, that bell that sits there is the only property of the Sigma Chi fraternity, but the University of Montana, on behalf of Prof. Shoy, the Secretary of Navy, and the USS Montana. That is the thousand-pound bell that has had quite a wild history since 1930, and then prior to that over our great oceans in uh, the battles and things of that sort, so the bell is, is quite interesting. So as a fraternity member, I've been a little unnerved that we couldn't get it back on our property, but as an older, older man of, uh, of the community, what a blessing to have it back on our soils, and, uh, and it's safe uh, there on the property of the University of Montana. We still don't know. We still do not know. So whoever had it, tip my hat to you for keeping it quiet. That's, it's amazing. <laughs> the true tradition of the Greek system uh, is pretty amazing. I can only assume that it was Greeks that happened to, to get a hold of that. Again, uh, the great professor passed away in 1954. Uh, he had uh, touched many lives, not only through the Sigma Chi fraternity, but uh, uh, a lot of uh, people in our community, whether, whether they were great senators, community members, uh, these were men and women that uh, he touched, and, and all those early faculty, that, uh, like our faculty of today, that helped mold our, our uh, young men and women that, uh, that now lead our, our communities, our state, and our nation. So uh, as a tribute to Professor Shoy, a great brother of the Sigma Chi fraternity, I tip my hat to him. Remembrance of his life are the white rose of Sigma Chi fraternity in a commemoration in, uh, of his work and his duty, his friendship, justice, and learning to the fraternity itself and to our community. Uh, a picture of him lies in front of his gravestone. The logo uh, that I selected here is not the current day badge of the Sigma Chi fraternity, but ironically enough, uh, prior to, uh, or just after his, his uh, becoming a member of the fraternity and starting our chapter here at the University of Montana in 1906, the badge you see before us uh, is an emblem of the fraternity from 1893, as an older emblem. It has several iterations since then. Uh, the current badge that uh, I wear upon my, above my heart here today is uh, where it's at, but I thought it very appropriate for Professor Shoy that the lamp of knowledge that's, that uh, was above the crest at the time in 1893 as a tribute to, to his, his energy and spirit of education and his love for youth and working with developing our, uh, our young adults as they go into our society. So I thought it was only appropriate for him in our uh, honor to, to his name as well as uh, Sigma Chi's that have uh, come before him and after. Uh, the, the wool coat you see lying at his uh, uh, gravestone also. Uh, he is uh, representative of the, the highest honor of the Sigma Chi fraternity, which is the Order of Constantine, which he uh, achieved and uh, recognized anyway in 1940. Uh, today, the, the gentleman that runs the entire fraternity, he's, he's called a, a Grand Consul, is uh, a uh, We've had uh, we're our 65th Grand Consul of the fraternity, and he was, in 1939, our 30th Grand Consul. So he had a huge influence of the Sigma Chi fraternity itself. The fraternity was, uh, was born in 1855, and uh, so you can see by 1891, when he became an undergraduate and a member of the fraternity, uh, it meant a lot to him. And when he came out to Montana and started fraternities, uh, the Sigma Chi fraternity, not only at this campus, but MSU in Washington, Idaho, Wyoming, and Utah, uh, the, the white badge of Sigma Chi meant a lot to him. So anyway, anyone have any questions about Professor Frederick Charles? Uh, in hoc signa wind case is, uh, our, is our Latin logo, so to speak, of uh, in this sign you will conquer. So you will conquer. So it's most fitting for, uh, for the fraternity and in particular Prof. Shoy. And I appreciate all of you coming in and, and listening to some of the stories of this great man. And enjoy the rest of your day. And good question, young lady. Thank you. you bet.